I guess what was it now that when this comes out is two day day before yesterday, uh, we heard sudden news that uh, Joe Laurinaitis, Road Warrior Animal, had passed away. We still don't know exactly what happened. I was not aware of him being in in bad health, as I mentioned earlier in the program. I saw him. It was a few years ago. Uh, he looked, you know, he looked great. He looked like Animal. So we don't know what happened there. But it was. I guess I did see that he was. He was on vacation, I guess, at a resort, I assume with his family or some family member. Um, but anyway, obviously, you know, this is a big deal. And I'm glad I'm glad they got the chance to do the Dark Side of the Ring show on the Road Warriors last year. The animal got to be a part of it. At least that got something out. I know you're a documentarian that likes to cover everything, but at least that was it would have it wouldn't have been able to have been done if both of them were gone and so at least they got that in um you know with hawk a lot of people have mentioned in in the past you kind of expected something cuz hawk was a wild man but animal was always the more calm level-headed business-like you know reasonable etc et i'm not knocking hawk here but you know what i'm trying to say animal was the guy you thought okay animal's all right so i you know didn't expect that but it's another way situations where you don't really know what to say but as as far as working with him being close to him we never had a single problem with either one of those guys and we figure Paul Ellering in with any of the three of them all the years that both versions of the midnight and I worked with them. Um, I've told a bunch of stories. I'll gleam over a few right now, but you can go back and look at our archives if you want to hear more details, but it just, the fact that they were always, see the difference between the road warriors and we talked recently about the ultimate warrior and how he was one of the big muscle guys that got into business, didn't know what he was doing and he never tried to get better. And he didn't care if he necessarily hurt people or how good his matches were. The road warriors were not of that ilk, neither Joe nor Mike. They got the rep when they started in the business, but they, they were stiff and they were going to hurt you and beat you up. And with the job guys on TV, in some cases that was true, not because they were pricks, but because they were fucking two goddamn giant badass bouncers, you know, 500 pound bench press on animal and Hawk with the fucking traps and whole nine yards. They were used to fighting and they just broke in the business. They were green. They weren't, they weren't being pricks. They were being stiff because they didn't know any, any other way. And you know, the old, story was true a lot of times the guys would walk into atlanta tv and the job guys and if they'd see they were going to go against the road warriors or buzz sawyer they wouldn't even put their bag down they'd just get back in the car and in the early and because buzz sawyer was a prick and would take advantage but with the road warriors it was just they were stiff because they were fucking huge and they were green and fortunately we didn't have to work with them for the first couple of years they were in the business. But when you think about it, what other tag team for, for their initial run, 1983, when they got put together through 1992, when the last of that WWF run, you know, fizzled and uh, Hawk and animal split up for a while and did the Japanese thing and whatever, they were always main event guys. They were always the highest paid guys or uh, the highest paid team, at least on the card in the NWA and in pretty much everywhere they went. They were always considered very top main event talent. They were never used in any underneath positions. That was a heck of a run because Ole was in a, a jam when he first put them together and he had to just smash some tag team over and that's what he did. And because they were so different, they looked different. They didn't sell anything. They were just so impressive. They didn't. Re they weren't really heels at first. They were. They were presented as heels, but they didn't know how to heal because they didn't really know how to cheat. So with Ellering as a manager, that at least got them the verbal heat. And and he also that's another thing. They they tried to learn. They listened to Paul, and he was already a veteran, so he was able to coach them. So uh, over those first couple of years, they they were definitely a top team. They were used great. They weren't the greatest workers, but they started learning how to work as themselves. 
as we've talked about here earlier on the show with other people, and they figured out what they could do that the road warriors should do. And it's not that they couldn't do anything else, but sometimes they shouldn't do other shit. So I've also shot the hole in the myth that they wouldn't sell. They would sell for you if it was done right. Nobody could go up to them face to face with the odds even and get the better of them. That would kill the road warriors. But even with smaller guys like the Midnight Express or me with a loaded racket, if you did it two on one or from behind or with a foreign object, they'd sell like crazy because they knew then that the team that was that they were working with was then going to get some heat on them so they could make their big comeback. And and they had to create some kind of jeopardy for themselves. And and really, if that's the only thing that hurt the Road Warriors toward the end of their run in the NWA was that they had such an invincible aura that people had had kind of stopped believing that anybody was going to beat them or or hurt them or whatever. Really, and it, and and it kind of it worked against them. You know, we've mentioned that, that when when a babyface team or babyface especially has no threat, then it's hard to get people interested. They're they're still over, but they don't want to pay to see the matches. So even though their first real big national money program, I think, was with the Russians, because that was a great fit. You had Nikita could fucking back up the goddamn physical part of it. Darso was a Minnesota guy that they knew and he could work like crazy. And Ivan Koloff was a veteran. And so the three of them with the road wars and Paul, that was money. And that made sense. And they worked at the AWA and the NWA and all over the place. But by then they were really starting to figure out how to do this stuff. And by the time that we got a chance to start working with them and, and met them, you know, at first you think Bobby and Dennis weren't fucking scared to look at those guys. And I'm like, holy fuck, I'm, you know, I'm going to be taking some bumps eventually. But once you, we sat and talked to them and worked with them a few times, you had to keep an eye out. They could sometimes get a little excited. And, you know, even a love tap for them was fucking, you know, deadly business. But once that they understood that we were going to do everything we could to put their shit over and make them look as good as possible, there was no problem ever in the ring. And they were funny as fuck to hang out with. Uh, you know, Paul was more laid back, but he's, uh, you know, I'd known him since Memphis in the late seventies and Joe and Mike, you know, they wanted to be, and were one of the boys, their matches got better. They care. They didn't just want a steamroller over everybody. Job guys on TV is one thing. That's where they're doing business. But they took care of guys that that they worked with that took care of them. And we enjoyed it. And like I said, I, I talked to Hawk more often. I've told the story about how he'd sit next to me on Crockett's plane. I made the deal with him. I said, if anything happens, knock me out, right? Don't worry, Jimmy. Because Hawk liked to get drunk and fuck it. And for some reason, I tickled him. So he'd every once like he'd get drunk on the plane every once in a while and put me over for jumping off the scaffold, right? You did it, kid, you know. But Joe, I got a chance to actually sit down and have lunch with a couple years ago at one of the the last Legends of the Ring deal that I went to up in New Jersey. I was in the hotel restaurant and had just ordered something to eat, and Joe came in and he was by himself too. So he said, "Hey, is the food any good here?" I said. It's okay whenever you get it. You might not, you know, get it till tomorrow. And he said, sit down. So we talked and bullshitted a while. And I didn't think anything of it at the time. Otherwise, it was nice to be able to sit down and and catch up with him and just, you know, tell some old stories and remember, oh, you remember so-and-so, you remember such-and-such. But it's especially, I guess, good now because that's the last time I saw him. And we actually got to sit down for the first time ever away from a wrestling event and with nobody else around and just have a nice conversation for 45 minutes or whatever. And, you know, we, we made a lot of money with those guys. W when you think about it, the, the road warriors versus the midnight express was probably, I know the midnight express is second most profitable program in their career uh, next to the rock and roll express. Um, it was probably the biggest drawing. The Midnight Rock and Roll gets all the attention on the record gates and all that stuff, but the Midnight Road Warriors was probably the second biggest 
bro- tag team program at, at the box office that the Midnight Express had, and I would say was probably behind Midnight Rock and Roll and Road Warriors and Russians, the biggest drawing NWA tag team program in the 80s. And it's just that, you know, they get attention for being with the Russians and we get attention for being with the rock and roll. But the scaffold match at Starcade 86, Flair and Nikita was the advertised main event, but the scaffold match was the feature match. It was kind of a double main event thing. And that was the first NWA event with all the closed circuit and everything drew a million dollars. Road Wars and Midnight, we have the uh, record in Philadelphia for the Civic Center. They jacked the prices up. We sold out, did $165,000 for the scaffold match there, which was the NWA's all-time best in Philly. Um, you know, the the match we're going to watch uh, here in a second was from the Crockett Cup 87, and for whatever reason, the Crockett Cup 87 is not on the WWE Network. And the entire match was not on the home video. We're going to see about seven minutes of it. <clears throat> but I know John fell in Baltimore. That was his first wrestling event. He said it's still the greatest thing he's ever seen. You mentioned that you w- went and watched it back before we're about to do it. And when Animal comes in and makes that comeback at the end and hits the flying shoulder block on on Big Bubba, the place fucking goes absolutely insane. It, it, the Road Warrior pop was not a rib. When they came out with that music, you couldn't hear yourself think in those buildings and the tags on the hot tags for the comebacks. They were just, the people went insane. Uh, So we're going to watch part of the Road Warriors Midnight Match from the Crockett Cup 87, which was my favorite of the ones that we had that's available on tape. There's another one we're probably going to do this weekend on the uh, drive-thru that is from a... TBS Saturday night show with Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton against the road Warriors. That's the one where baby doll knocked me out in the finish, but a lot of people forget there was a world tag team title match in front of that. That was on an all time record crowd in Raleigh. So, you know, we dusty was really, really on his game in the mid eighties in that in the tag team division, Whoever the champions were, he could book matches with any one of three or four opposing teams, and they meant something because of something that had been done on television and there was issues between the teams. So when we were the champions, we could defend against the Road Wars, the Rock and Roll, Dusty and Magnum, you know, anybody, and it meant something. So we got a chance to work with them a lot through 86, again, some in 87, and then Later on in in 89, right before they left WCW, I've told this story, they insisted on putting us over in Memphis. uh, The the match the night before, I think, was St. Louis. Even though the Road Warriors were leaving, Heard wouldn't let the midnight go over anybody, so they sent the word to to, uh, go ahead and put the Road Warriors over. I guess he didn't want to ask them for a job anyway. And the next night we're in Memphis and they say, you know, it's bullshit. We're leaving. You're staying. This is your town. We're going to put you guys over. So they did it. The only team that they ever actually said, we want to put these guys over their whole run in WCW. And the next night the office had heard about it and changed it and said, no, we still want you guys to win anyway. So they came up with a finish where Paul jerked me in and pinned me to save the midnight. But that, that they would do shit for you when you treated them good. And and like I said, toward the toward the end of their main run, they had really, especially Animal. I mean, Mike Mike came along, but he was the party guy. But but they had really polished what they could do in the ring, so they weren't the 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 dangerous guys, you know that that they once were to their opponents. They just seemed like it to the fans. I, I sang you that Christmas carol I made up for him one time, didn't I? I'm not sure I know I, what you're talking about. I, 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 I've made him a Christmas carol, and I sang it to him on the, on Crockett's plane one night. I was diving through the ropes to get out of the fucking way. Here they come again. Taters all the way. It's the Road Warriors. <laughs> 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 but anyway, um, I mean, I don't Like I said, you know, besides the rock and roll, the Fantastics matches were great, but we didn't make the money at the box office. The program with Tully and Arn just didn't go on long enough. In historical significance, uh, the Road Warriors would have been, besides the rock and roll, our definitely most profitable and most 
you know, historically significant opponents. And, you know, I, 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 I hate for people who saw the, the late nineties WWF stuff and all that stuff to think that was the road warriors. Cause it was, it was a different time and place then, but from, especially from the time they started in Georgia, but really when they started kicking it in good in late 84, early 85, the AWA stuff, then when Crockett snatched them through the time they left WCW, that was the fucking heyday of the road wars. And there was nobody more. They were a tag team is like Rock and Perez in the fifties. You could put them on the fucking card. It didn't need a world title match, single main event, whatever. The road wars were as big at the, at the box office as anybody that we had in the, in the company at the time. In terms of wrestling history, what's their standing as a drawing card, as a attraction? Worldwide, obviously, big stars oh, in Japan huge. and everywhere they went in America. Well, yeah, because every time that the Japanese people would see those tapes on TV, they'd be, oh, my God, they were tailor-made for Japan. And even though they didn't get to do a huge run as partners with each other, they were still a major force. And then uh, Hawk, you know, uh, comprised the team with who was it? Kensuke Sasaki, the Hellraisers? Yeah, but they were pretty big in all Japan for several years before that. But it, Well, yeah, but I mean, they didn't get the, the 90s part. The, the 80s run when they were at all Japan was because they were being booked through the NWA. And they were, yeah, they were definitely huge there. But I mean, they, I just wish they hadn't have broken up in the nineties and, and other partners and it got confusing. And that WWF run was, Ooh, and I know an animal had, <laughs> and this is why Lloyd's of London, one of the reasons along with Rick rude. And I can't remember who all else, but one of the reasons, Kurt, why, Hennig. What, Kurt Henning, it was all the Minnesota guys. <laughs> yeah. Lloyd's of London doesn't insure wrestlers anymore and hadn't for some time because animal had a an insurance policy, and when he did get a legitimate back injury, he collected and retired from wrestling. But when he came back, the settlement was, because we were then in the WWF, we were trying to book these guys in different ways. He had made a settlement that his career as a, re as a singles wrestler was over. He could never have another singles match, but he could have a tag team match. So we could book the Road Wars, but we couldn't book Joe as a single. Or it would void his insurance settlement it was i don't know but anyway i always remember the road warriors that fucking 80s run and their legacy and the way they'll be remembered they were the the modern day Rocca and perez not in terms of style or by any means but because they were the only real Rock and Perez were the only tag team that was ever the number one box office draw in a calendar year in the wrestling business because of their incredible run in the Northeast. The Road Warriors were the closest thing to that because they were the closest thing to being a tag team top box office attraction in the business after Rock and Perez. It was always, it could have been Andre or it could have been Bruno or it could have been the NWA champion. It was never a tag team. Even the Midnight and Rock and Roll overall for that hot couple of years we had, still we, we, we cracked the top 10 list, but we didn't get into a top position. The Road Warriors were as close as ever, any tag team has come since then. And, and everybody remembers the, the entrance. Everybody remembers the music. Everybody remembers the promos. Everybody remembers the whole fucking deal. And they were the, the most badass team in wrestling. And that's why for that whole run until it started getting monkey with, but that whole first run nine years, they were always main event guys always used on top. They had the biggest contract, uh, for Crockett when he started giving out contracts they had the biggest behind Flair and Sting and Luger when WCW started giving them out. And they even had, <clears throat> they had a better fucking deal because they negotiated uh, maximum dates. So they got 2,500 bucks each for 200 dates a year. And Paul got a, a grand. No, wait, wait a minute. It was two grand each for 250 dates. That's what, cause it was 500 grand. And Paul got to be their manager, got half of that. So he got a grand for 250 dates or 250 grand. And Turner Broadcasting wouldn't have turned loose of that amount of money if they hadn't been synonymous with the company. So anyway, 
When was the it, first time you saw a pair of Zubaz pants? Um, it, uh, on one of the Minnesota guys. Uh, that's another thing people might not know. They got in. It was I think Darso was in it too. They all all the Minnesota guys started using the same financial manager when they started making all this big money. And one of the first companies they invested in was the Zubaz Pants because they were big and baggy for the weightlifting guys. I liked them because of my big, broad, white, fat ass. <laughs> but they liked them because they you could do squats and everything. So the wrestlers wearing Zubaz all over the 80s and early 90s in the wrestling business, the road warriors were making money off of it or handing out free samples. They did that all the time. They helped popularize the Ribera Steakhouse jackets as well. Yeah, they could make, they could have worn some of the shit the guys are wearing on AEW and made it look cool because it just, it just did. And, you know, a lot, I, of people, a lot of people think, like, the AWA died as soon as Hulk Hogan left. But the Road Warriors were really responsible for holding it up for a couple of years after that. Oh, God, yeah. Well, and that's uh, – when we first went to work for Crockett, they were starting to do the cross-promotional matches where Crockett would send the Russians to, to the AWA to Vern to work with the Road Warriors, and they were taking the match around the country in different promotions. And – you know, besides the fact we knew we we, we were going to have to work with these guys eventually, it was a bit, th there were huge crowds. And uh, honestly, who was it? The only other team to beat the Road Warriors when they finally decided to make the deal with Crockett and come for the big money. They did drop the belts on the way out in the AWA to Steve Regal and gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, who probably said on, the, on their best day, they never figured they were going to get to beat the Road Warriors, but they got a disputed job out of them there. Hey, did Stan ever tell you the story about the Fabulous Ones Road Warriors match? Yes. Where... <laughs> you know yes. what I'm talking about already, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And there was actually, there was a little residual heat actually to where when Stan replaced, and this is, it's funny because this Crockett Cup 87 match was literally one week after Stan replaced Dennis as a member of the Midnight Express. And we're going into Crockett Cup in Baltimore, sold out Civic Center, going to work with the Road Warriors, right? But there was some residual heat on the part of the Warriors. The story was that the Fabulous Ones had been booked by Vern uh, from Tennessee. They left Jarrett and they went up to the Minnesota because he brought him in as the rock and roll baby faces. Well, the thing is, he, there was no Jackie Fargo tradition nor Jackie Fargo promos in Minnesota in the AWA. He brought him in as rock stars, but without that backstory that Jared had told, they were heelish. They were these fucking sexy male stripper looking ladies men with these flashy outfits and the rock and roll music. But they didn't have the beloved icon Jackie Fargo introducing them and behind them, so it completely switched in the AWA, and the Fabs were the heels, even though they weren't portrayed as such. And the Road Warriors, who were kicking the shit out of everybody, were starting to become the baby faces, even though they were the heels. So and Vern just didn't get the the whole Fabs thing, and they didn't he didn't get this dynamic that was going on. So one night. They're going to work in a house show and the finish comes in and the road wars didn't like the finish. So instead of bothering to argue about it in the locker room, because it's a separate locker rooms, but argue with the agent or the person giving the finish, they just went in the ring. And as they're standing there getting the pre-match introductions, I think it was Hawk went up and said, we don't like the finish. We're going to do something else. Just do it our way and nobody gets hurt. Well, Stan here's and this is Stan's first introduction to these giant face painted monsters, right? When they're going to go up and work this program, so he he already decides that he doesn't want any trouble. But Kern, <laughs> as was his habit, is standing there as the referee does his thing or whatever the fuck. Kern is looking down at the mat, kicking shit, looking out in the front row to see what the good looking girls look like. He's not paying a lick of attention. So when Hawk said that. Kern looked up and legitimately, because he didn't hear, said, huh? <laughs> and the road warriors thought it was, oh, they're going to be smart about this. And here they came, Stan covered up. He's like, what the fuck? And they come with the goddamn jump start <laughs> and fucking boom, 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 boom. And Kern's like, fine, whatever the fuck. I don't know what the fuck's going on here. And, and, and then they did it the road warriors way and nobody got hurt. 
but that was and there was still a little a, just a, a little tinge a little leftover steam i think on stan from because they loved dennis because dennis fucking made him look like a million dollars too but stan had to kind of prove himself a little bit it was and then finally you know everything was fine after we had a number of matches and everything but you had to do it our way and nobody gets hurt huh oh <laughs> and kirk can handle himself you oh, yeah that, that's the thing i mean if you had It'd been like Ronnie Garvin when he shot with Hawk in in the you know locker room at Veteran Stadium in Philly that night of the bash. If they were wrestling, Kern would have probably taken either one down by himself and out wrestled them. But at that point, it wasn't going to be about wrestling. So and then that's where Kern would have come up short. So you know it, it would have been interesting. And Stan would have been out in the front row probably with the girls that Kern was checking out, waiting to see what was going to happen because he didn't <laughs> want any party. He wasn't that serious about any of it, right? Oh, good lord! Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody. We miss you, Animal. We love you, and we'll see everybody next week. Bye, bye, everybody.